Uh, you can leave that we'll just, we'll You'll be right to do it from there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we probably hope you can electronic copy. I'll speak to I'll still let you know we'll send it to you. Well, I said they should give you an electronic copy. Oh, You'll thank be an electronic you very copy. much. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Krishna Stevens, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for um, indulging us today and coming in a bit earlier and um, having a chance to be briefed on the organisational reform program and the release of. Sorry, I'm just going to stop you there. I think that was my best stuff, too. <laughs> it was fantastic. Well, yeah. It goes downhill from here. Now, is there anyone else who wants to check, please? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Go really sorry about that. No problems. Um, so today is, uh, marks an important milestone with our organisational reform program uh, and the release of three major papers that impact on how we're going to deliver, poli deliver policing services for the South Australian community as we go forward to 2020. Uh, this uh, review that we are undertaking is probably the largest review uh, in almost 20 years for South Australia police, police and it will see a substantial change in how we deliver our policing services at the front line. Uh, our aim is to ensure that we maintain uh, the level of service that the community has come to p expect and that we actually get the best use of the resources we have at our disposal. Uh, the important thing to point out with this reform is that uh, We've taken a deliberate approach to ensure that we implement the changes, which, as, as I say, are the most significant in almost 20 years, in a measured and deliberate way to ensure the success of the reform. What this means is that we're aligning the changes to our operating model, uh, the way we structure our policing response, with uh, a reformed uh, focus on our people strategy and also looking at the technology improvements that we're delivering over the next three to four years. In order for each of those different components to be successful, they need to be done in a measured way and uh, we've paced out our reform program implementation from now until the end of 2020. And I think this is a very exciting time for SAPOL. This is an opportunity for us to uh, bring our people along to ensure they understand the changes which are going to take place and how those changes affect the way we do business and where our people will be operating from and how they will do their job. So uh, I couldn't be more excited about the fact that we've reached this point in time where we can release the final papers which have been developed as a result of significant research, consultation with our workforce, uh, extensive consultation and also collaboration with other law enforcement agencies within Australia and overseas to come up with what we think is the right model for South Australia as we move forward. Why were these changes needed? Well, the reality is we live in a changing environment. Uh, we have uh, greater capability through technology. Uh, communications uh, ex far exceed our capacity uh, in past years. And what these changes mean is we're able to, to, to deploy our people differently. We're not, we're not restricted by traditional boundaries and traditional operating principles because we are adapting with technology and a changing environment. We also see a change within the community in terms of their expectations of police and our ability to provide a policing service to meet those expectations is also changing based on skill sets, training and uh, the equipment we have at our disposal. So there's a range of factors that have dictated that we should be looking at how we deliver our services to ensure that they are appropriate in the circumstances. What does this mean for the average citizen? What difference are they going to see how are they going to be better served? Well, I suppose, um, as a minimum, uh, the community of South Australia should see no difference because we will continue to provide a high level of service to the community. Uh, my goal is to ensure that our response times for people calling for assistance are improved and that we're able to prevent more crime by working more closely with the community across the board as opposed to uh, some targeted areas where we currently provide that level of uh, community-based policing. How much money will be saved through these changes? Well, there's uh, probably an expenditure of funds in order to set up uh, some of the centralised functions that uh, appear within the model. Uh, but I wouldn't anticipate there's any savings in terms of the, uh, the allocation of funding for resources uh, because we're using the same number of uh, staff that we currently have. We're just deploying them in a different way. Why are you increasing the number of officers allocated to child and family investigations? I think it's a reality in today's environment that there's a greater awareness within the community about the risk that some children are at and uh, there's an expectation as a policing service that we are responding to that need. We're capable of investigating the, the number of complaints that we identify and investigate them effectively. So there's, a, there's an imperative there that I think we need to, uh, to meet. Are there any more plans for further civilian work within the police force, perhaps in intelligence or at this point in time, um, we've uh, tested the concepts of uh, civilianising uh, triple zero call taking and custody management, and we think that is the best way forward. 
Um, given the current uh, policy settings and uh, the resources available, um, we don't envisage that we'll step into that space until uh, 2020. Um, in custody? custody management and triple zero call taking. Yeah. In terms of what other opportunities there may be to take police out of back office functions and put them onto the front line, we'll continue to examine that as we move forward because my goal is to ensure that uh, police officers are doing operational police work wherever possible and we use qualified civilians for the functions that can be properly conducted by qualified civilians. Commissioner, how will these changes stop high speed chases? Well, uh, that's probably something, if you like, we can talk about afterwards when we finish talking about reform. But uh, this is about a comprehensive uh, service delivery model across the board, ranging from all aspects of uh, crime, investigation, road safety. It doesn't focus on any one particular aspect. It ensures that we can deliver a proper and effective service uh, across all of those areas that the community would ex expect us to be working within. Was it not effective under the system at the moment? Beg your pardon? Was it not effective? I think we've been providing a, a, an exceptionally good service to the community of South Australia. What I'm ensuring is that we remain adaptive and contemporary so we are able to meet the ongoing and continuing changing demands that we face as a policing service within the community. And it's important to point out that the current model that we're working within was established back in about 1998 and it has served us extremely well and I think we are uh, regarded as one of the most effective police services in Australia and it's because of the model we're operating in. The changes that I described before dictate that we should be reviewing how we deliver our services and this new model I think provides us that capacity to, re to remain as effective as we have been in the past. Well, following on from Batman Tellis' question about yep. for example, would the Well, we're seeing benefits from automatic vehicle location already in terms of where our patrols are based or located and monitoring their deployment. We intend to utilise that type of technology as much as we possibly can to ensure we have our police in the right place at the right time and to direct them to different locations where we think we can get the best service from them. It does. Uh, I think it's a reality for any industry uh, that change uh, comes with some challenges and we are no different to that. Um, in fact, we've been um, talking about this reform program for quite some time and I appreciate that the South Australian Police Workforce is uh, keen to see what this really means for them. So that makes today a very important day because we are locking in a model for the future of South Australia Police and the South Australian community in terms of the way we provide our service. As police move across to um, different areas as part of changes, will any officers be required to reapply for their jobs or roles that they're currently in? No, we, we anticipate as we move towards uh, implementing the district model and changing uh, to response and district policing teams that most people who are currently working in an operational environment will find that they, they are minimally affected by those sorts of changes. Where we do have officers who are affected by that in, in terms of uh, needing to be transferred to other areas, we'll work with individual officers to ensure that they are you know, put in a position that suits them as well as us. Are this, is this getting more people out of the office and out of the world? In some respects, yes. Uh, we, we look at increasing the number of police we have in that response and district policing function um, across the board, so uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about that too, that we'll have more people able to respond to calls for assistance. What about percentages for female officers, Indigenous workers? Have you highlighted any of that? Oh, well, as a, that's part of our people strategy, is to ensure that we maintain our focus on diversity, and that's not just about gender, it's also about uh, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities as well. So we are focused on ensuring that the South Australia Police represents the community it serves. So is the police that we see play still on the table, or is that...? Uh, gender parity is still a target that we have established and uh, we're not resolving from that. So that's a continuing theme of how we um, manage our workforce and uh, with the current recruiting program we have in place, we still maintain a target of 50-50. How many more police will we actually see as a result of these changes? Well, there's, uh, there's two dimensions to that. Um, we're moving police from uh, some functions that we currently undertake now. We're changing the way we deliver those services, which means we can move police to different locations. I would estimate that we're probably within the metropolitan area have an additional... 50 police available to respond in frontline operational policing activities than what we do today. But in conjunction with that, uh, we also have the additional police that are coming online as, as a result of the government's commitment to finalising the 313 additional police. And those police, uh, we're currently looking at the best opportunities to enhance some of the existing priorities that we service and looking at emerging priorities to ensure that we have uh, police in the right places. My, my goal is to uh, ensure that uh, regional policing is adequately resourced as well as metropolitan policing. So we'll be seeing some additional police go to country locations. I understand that district officers will be taking over the 
taking opportunities like neighbourhood watch. Um, if they've got more on their hands, will that um, uh, have any impact on services like that? No, we're absolutely committed to ensuring that our uh, work with uh, groups like Neighbourhood Watch, um, Blue Light, uh, continue because they are a fundamental part of our crime prevention uh, approach. The district policing teams, uh, uh, part of the, the, the philosophy is that these people are integrated within the communities they're serving and, and being a part of Neighbourhood Watch and those other community-based functions is an important part of that. But it's not just about community engagement, it is about targeting criminals who uh, cause problems within particular geographic locations, understanding their community, understanding who are causing the problems and working with other agencies to prevent those problems from occurring. We see these policing teams, I mean the idea is great that they'll be out there engaging but isn't there a risk that, given already high workloads, that in reality they're just going to be responding to things? Well, we've put a lot of energy into um, developing this model and a lot of research has gone into how we actually balance the need to respond to calls for assistance and to provide that uh, crime prevention and uh, longer-term investigation problem-solving approach within the local community. And we're satisfied, uh, based on the modelling we've done, that the resources we've allocated to uh, grade one, grade two response is sufficient to to manage that workload in the majority of cases and that the district policing teams will be able to undertake the work that we've allocated for them. There will always be occasions when we have a surge in activity that might require people to be more adaptable and that's part of the way we do business anyway. And in terms of changing the districts, were there some areas which had too many resources and now you're beefing up others in northern areas and large? Uh, it's not as simple as just moving people into different uh, locations. We've actually changed the boundaries as a part of this model and those changes will take effect in 2018. Uh, we've actually done a, a complete analysis of the workloads across the entire metropolitan area and we've realigned our boundaries to ensure that there is a balance between each of the four new districts that we're creating. Has SAFON done any costings about how much work the form will cost to set up? Uh, we've done the costings. I don't have them available with me at the time. Uh, but we intend to meet all of the costs associated with implementing these reforms within our existing budget allocation. What about rolling savings from there on in? Uh, we anticipate that there will be savings um, as a result of the way we're conducting our business and uh, once again we'll meet any costs associated with the implementation from our existing allocation and where we do have productivity savings we'll be looking to use those productivity savings to um, focus on other priorities. For anyone who may say that this was a cost saving measure, what would you what would be your response? This has never been about cost um, and it's, uh, it's unfair to suggest uh, anything else. It will cost us some money to implement this and we're We've, we've funded that within our existing allocation. And the fact that we are utilising the same resources to deliver a better service means that we're not actually saving money on uh, reducing police numbers or anything like that. This is a legitimate reform to deliver a better service to the community of South Australia. And it's not about cost. How important is it for SAPAs to keep up with technological advances? Oh, it's critically important. Uh, technology is a driver in so many factors in what we do. And there are positives and negatives for us. Uh, technology is being used by criminals to facilitate existing crimes in new ways and it's also being used to create crimes or to commit crimes that have never been committed before. So we need to be uh, up to speed with what technology is uh, enabling criminals to do but it also gives us capacity to respond to crime in a different way, to enable people to make contact with police and report crime in new ways as well. So it's fundamental to us being uh, a relevant and effective policing service. And just on that, at the moment you've got two fugitives on the run who are taunting police mainly using social media. How frustrating is that for your officers to have to investigate those? Uh, look, the reality is that social media um, can be a, an effective tool for us, uh, in, both in communicating with the, the broader community, but also in, in tracking uh, offenders and also locating people as well. So um, I'd suggest that uh, people who think they're taunting us are probably providing us some opportunities to track them down. So we'll, we'll take advantage of that opportunity as it arises. Thank you. Just I have no intentions of closing any further stations at this point, but I would like to make specifically the point that uh, the stations we've closed are based on um, a proper assessment of the, the workload activity within those stations, the utilising of those stations by the community, and uh, most of the changes we've made have been to align the operating hours of those police stations with the service delivery requirements of the local communities. So by Adjusting the hours of our police stations, we've been able to put more police officers into patrol cars, which I think is a, a great outcome. Commander, well, just on, um, get your response to this, the Liberals have just put out an alert for oppressors saying police cuts formalised. What's your response to those? I'd, I'd have to say that's uh, a, a, a confusion of the facts. 
Um, there are no cuts associated with this reform and I'm happy for anyone to come in and have a look at the, the process that we've undertaken to come up with this model, uh, to have insights into the, uh, the costing arrangements. And the reality is, if we have a certain number of police today and we're operating with the same number of police officers tomorrow, the costs do not change. Is the state police budget increasing or decreasing? Uh, currently we're being um, funded for the additional, the remainder of the additional 313 police, so we do have an increase in our budget. Beyond that, is it decreasing? Uh, no, I've had no conversations with anybody within government about a, a decreasing police budget. I wouldn't anticipate that's something that's on the agenda. We're, just, we're funded for the services we provide. Just personally, from your aspect, uh, betting these seem to just be your, your career achievement. Um, I've, I suppose each, each milestone or each point in your career where you reflect on what you've achieved, you, you, you identify different things that uh, stand out as milestones and things that you consider to be achievements. This would certainly be something that I'd be very proud of to be able to lead the organisation into a, uh, a, a change that sees it being uh, capable of meeting the demands of the community as we go forward. I'd be very happy that this, um, this reform rolls out in the way we anticipate. Questions. Questions. Yep. Chases, so, yep. so, okay, so we're, we're done on that. So, just uh, any other questions on reform, please? Okay. Um, just on the reform, thank you for coming in and spending the time uh, with the team to develop an understanding. Uh, we do appreciate the fact that you've done that. It's, um, yeah, obviously there's a lot of information there and uh, the opportunity to give you that insight um, is good for us and I hope, hope you uh, got some benefit from it. So right. how will these changes uh, stop high speed changes?